Hello and welcome to the Runlet and Baldacci Report. In the last few months, we've had some really big people on our show. We've had uh, Senate, uh, Senator George Mitchell. We've had Secretary of Defense Bill Cohen. We've had B.B. Buell. Um, and uh, we've had uh, Gianni Russo. Well, uh, in our mob theme, which we've enjoyed <laughs> in the last year or so, uh, tonight we have somebody really big. Uh, if you watch Netflix, uh, one of the top shows on Netflix right now is called Get Gotti. It's all about John Gotti, who was well, one of the most famous mobsters of all time. And with us tonight uh, is a, a gentleman who was on that show, featured huge in that show. And uh, he's, his father was also a member of that family. Uh, I, my only hope uh, is that... Uh, uh, our show is good enough to be used on his podcast. <laughs> uh, I hope we pass the audition. Rob, tell us who our guest is. Well, I'm very pleased to, uh, to introduce our, our very special guest, uh, Anthony Ruggiano. Anthony, welcome via Zoom. Uh, we're here in Portland, Maine, and uh, we're going to take some time with uh, Anthony today to, to talk about his life, uh, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and... Uh, <laughs> and what he's doing now and uh, you know, how he's turned his life around. Uh, we've had a number of uh, uh, former mobsters on our show. Uh, we've had uh, John Elite, we've had uh, Bobby Luizzi, Paul Tanzo. I don't know if I'd count Gianni I Russo. I was gonna say Gianni's kind of on the fringe. Kind of in the middle there. <laughs> but uh, he, a real, a real uh, former mafioso, uh, Anthony Ruggiano, who, uh, Grew up in the family. With your dad was in the uh, was in the mafia. Can you, Anthony, tell us a little bit about your life, your dad growing up in uh, New York, and how you got to be a made man? You know, um, so when I was a kid, you know, um, I always knew something was different about my father than, than my friends' fathers, or even my uncles, for that matter. You know, when I used to go to my cousins' houses. I always knew there was something different about him just by the way um, people interacted with him. And when he would take you with him, how, you know, when he walked in a room, like the atmosphere would change. And, and, I, and I always felt that something was different, but I, I never knew what it was. You know, I put my finger on it because I was, I was a kid. And uh, even when I went to school, which I talk about this a lot, even when I went to school and, um, you know, the teacher would say, tomorrow we're going to discuss what uh, your parents do for a living. Well, back then only... <laughs> Most of the households, just the fathers worked and the mothers stood home when right. I was a kid in the 60s and 50s. Not like today, everybody has to go to work. So, um, and I would go home and I would tell my father, Dad, I need to know what you do for a living because we're going to discuss it tomorrow. And he would tell me he worked for dry cleaners. <laughs> Good. <laughs> because he had some guy with him that owned dry cleaners and he was on the books with them. I found this out later. Yeah. So, But I knew that wasn't true. And, and but I rolled with it anyway. I would go to school the next day and I would, Tell the teacher my my father works for a, in a dry cleaners, and I knew I knew that wasn't true, but I didn't know what the truth was. But I knew that wasn't it, and I but I said it anyway. Yeah. And um and then when I when I branched off my block, you know, because back then in New York we all hung out on our block, we played stickball and all that on our block. When I became a teenager, like twelve or thirteen, I drifted off the block into the neighborhood, and I started hanging out by this pizzeria on 101st Avenue, and when I would walk up to the corner, the older kids, would I would hear them whispering, going, that's Fatty Andy's son. And that's when I started to learn and figure out what and who my father was. Uh, Anthony, that, uh, that uh, description reminds me a lot of the beginning of the Bronx tale exactly. by Charles Palminteri and the little boys running around. And, and uh, uh, you lived that life. You, you mentioned the stickball. One of the things that uh, that, I, that uh, Rob is going down that road is that once you realize, how old were you when you realized uh, my my dad is an organized crime? How old were you actually understood that? In my very early teens. So 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 now when I when I started hanging out in the neighborhood, my father started taking me to. It was a lot of social clubs in Ozone Park, like the Bergen Hunt Fish Club where right. John Gotti hung out. The, this guy, Cyril Perron, he was a, Gen a, a captain with the Genovese family. He had a club and all these wise guys had clubs in my neighborhood. And my father started bringing me to these clubs and uh, and introducing me to these people saying, this is my son. If you see him in the neighborhood, because he didn't want them to hurt me if I did anything wrong. And he wanted them to know who I was to look out for me. So that's when I started figuring things out. And then um, 
when I through older guys. And then when I was about 15, there was some articles in the newspaper about them. And um, and then I started getting in trouble on my own. And actually, when I was 16, um, so there was an article. He got arrested. He got indicted for this on this big bookmaking case in Brooklyn. And it was on the front page of the Daily News. And and uh, I went home that day and my kid brother didn't know anything. And uh, and he said to me, did you read the newspaper? Is that true about daddy? And I said, yeah. You know, and my father was, uh, he used to come to all our Little League games. He was like a normal dad in the house. You know, took us to the Yankee games, took us to the fights. He loved boxing. We went to see all the boxing matches. He went to all my brother's Little League games. And and I went upstairs and, and I knew then who he was. And my father said, did Albert read the newspaper? And I said, yeah. And we went downstairs and my father said to Albert, do you want me to still come to your baseball game? And my brother goes, yeah, of course I do. And we went to the game that night and all the fathers, nobody knew who my father was. They just thought he was a little league dad. But when, so when he got out of the car and we went up to the grandstand, all these fathers like bum rushed. Oh, Andy, my God, we didn't know. And they were all up his ass. And later on in years, he actually got a couple of their sons into the carpenters union and everything. So that's how I learned. I learned through that experience through the neighborhood. And then when I was 16, I got uh, suspended from school. I was a truant. I didn't like school. I was a bad student. And um, he sat me down with my uncle, his uncle, my older uncle, my older, his older brother, Frank. Um, we sat down in my kitchen and uh, he wanted to get me a job in the in the Brooklyn Union. And I told him, I don't want to work in no fucking Brooklyn Union. <laughs> and I was only 16. And he looked at me and he goes, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to work for you. And, you know, uh, and he just looked at me and, and, he, and, he, and he looked at me and he tapped on the table with his finger and he went, well, if you want to work for me, remember, going to jail is all part of the fucking job. And now here I am, 16, and I, I, I was raised in that life. All, sure. That's all I knew my whole life because he was became a made member the same year I was born in 1953. I was born in 53 right. and he was made by Albert Anastasia in 53. He was only wow. 26 years old. That. That picture and behind your me, dad and that's mom, the, he was 26 years old in that picture. Wow. And uh, and and he put me to work the next day. He took me to this uh, club in on Merrick Road in Long Island. This guy, Philly, the pimp owned it. That was his nickname. I don't know if he was a pimp or not, but that, that was his <laughs> nickname. And uh, and he had a blackjack game. And that's what and that was my first illegal job. I worked in the blackjack game. I, wow. I, I, Anthony, I, I, I know that you uh, were born in 53. I was about to uh, ask that. Um, but what what I want to know is what was the first crime, major crime that you committed? And at what age did you commit that crime? The first major crime I committed, I was 21 years old. We, we robbed a, a liquor warehouse. We broke into through, through, we rented this. We rented an empty store next to this big warehouse and we went through the wall and we emptied out all the cases of liquor. And we were loading them up on a truck and we were arrested. And I went to trial and I got convicted. And that was the first time I went to prison. I got a five year sentence and um, I right. turned myself in when I was 24 years old. And, 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 I, and I went to prison for two and a half years. Right. So you got a five year sentence on a first offense. First felony offense, yeah. First, well, okay, first, oh, so you had a record before that for, for some small yes. things. Yeah, I had, I got, I had assault cases. I got arrested for possession of I had a uh, for drugs, uh, you know, possession of, of narcotics. But uh, but it, it was all dismissed and fines. I paid fines. I got arrested for an assault with a deadly weapon that was dismissed because the person that got hit with the bat didn't show up in court, so they dismissed the charges. But the first time I went to trial and got convicted was when I was 21 years old. How long was the jury out? <laughs> Not long. The jury was out maybe about six hours. So well, actually, we almost beat the case. The actually, day. actually, six hours. Yeah. Is, six hours yeah. is a long time. Yeah, uh, about six hours. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, Anthony. Uh, at what point did you become a made man? And I was never and get straight. So what happened was I was. So what happened was when I was proposed when I got out of prison, um, they proposed me. So what that means is. They pass around your name to all the other families to see if anybody has anything bad to say about you and to get approval. So my name was passed around and I was approved. So I was sent for by this captain called Lenny Di Maria and uh, um, in the Gambino family. And he told me, listen, your name got passed around. Um, everything's approved. 
They gave me permission to represent myself to go on sit downs. So I had the I, I had the um the okay to to present myself as a made member, but they just didn't have the official ceremony yet. Um, they were they were going to have it in a few weeks from that day, but a week later I was arrested for murder, and I never really and we never had the ceremony. But I was a proposed member, and I had permission to go on sit downs at that point in time. I didn't need any representation. So what happened? So I, I, what happened after you, what, Anthony, what happened after you were accused of murder? Yeah, right. Well, I got, what happened was, so I got out of prison in, I got out of prison in, in uh, I, in 2004. I and, just finished where, where doing did an you eight, eight year sentence. Where did you serve that prison sentence? Well, I start, well, well, that's, okay. So I got indicted for bookmaking, which is legal now, sports betting, everything's right. legal now. Yep. Um, I got indicted in 95 on a big bookmaking case in New York by the, by the New York State Organized Crime Task Force. So I took a plea. I got a two to four. While I was in New York State custody serving that sentence, I was indicted by the feds in Broward County, Florida, with Nikki Carraza, who was the acting boss of the Gambino family at the time. Um, and I got indicted on a case in Florida. The marshals took me to Florida and I took a plea and I got 10 years. Wow. So, so I did. So between New York State and the feds, I was in school kill for the last five years. I did eight years and three months. I got out in 04. And uh, and a year later, I got indicted for another RICO with a murder uh, predicate, you know, for gambling and murder. Um, I was actually sitting in front of my son's house. I mean, I was working. I was driving a truck. I was waiting for the ceremony to get straightened out because I sure. just had a conversation with Lenny Di Maria. And I was sitting on a park bench relaxing with my eyes closed and the next thing I hear don't move you fucking scumbag and I open up my eyes and there's a gun in my nose and I was surrounded by FBI agents and and, and they arrested me wow uh, uh, Anthony uh, two, two points first of all sounds to me like you should have had some better lawyers but the other point is uh, <laughs> that, that while you while you say that bookmaking is certainly legal uh, they haven't made uh, murder legal yet uh, <laughs> no, definitely not um uh, uh, uh Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> no. Let, so obviously we all know that you you were in the recent uh, Netflix uh, uh, yes. show. Get Gaudy. Uh, terrific job. A great, great right. show. Highly recommended. Uh, well, it's for, fascinating. For, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well done. Uh, tell us about John Gaudy. When was the first time you met him, uh, Anthony? And and what was it like to be around him? Because from us up here in Maine, We'd see him on TV. Oh, yeah. We'd see him in the magazines and newspapers. Sure. He was he was bigger than life. And 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 what I uh, yeah the thing I want you to hit on is the fact that he was so so revered uh, because he was good looking and dressed good and looked like a movie star. Oh but yeah. He was a, a mean and a bad man. So tell us. Yeah. Go ahead. Tell us how you met him. So the first time I met him, I was thirteen years old. Like I said, when I drifted off my block into the neighborhood and my father took me around to meet all these people. So there was this wise guy, Charlie Wagons. He's actually the maid member of the of the mafia that proposed my father, that straightened out my father. He's actually the same member that proposed John Gotti. John Gotti and my father were made by the same member, Charlie Wagons. They were both proposed by Charlie. So I already knew Charlie from all my life through my father. Yep. So him I knew. And my father took me to Charlie's club, which was at the time the Bergen Fish Club. And that's where I met John Gotti and Angelo Quack Quack and all of them. And, uh, and that was the beginning of my relationship with John. I would see him in the neighborhood. He was always sharp. He wasn't even straightened out then. He was just a young man. You know, he was just in the street. Um, and, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, and we became friends. I would see him in the neighborhood when I, you know, then when I turned 16 and I started working for my father. Then I would see him by the Ravenite. I would see him in the crap games. You know, I would see him all the time in the racetrack. He used to go to the racetrack every day until he got bought out. And he always had charisma. People were always attracted to him. Yep. And even, and I talk about this a lot. My father told me when I was a kid, he said he had a prediction. He goes, only three things are going to happen to John Gotti. He said, either he's going to become the boss He's going to get shot in the head or he's going to get a thousand years in prison. And two out of those three things came true. Came sure. true. 
So, Anthony, you were talking about Gaudi, uh, yeah. larger than life, uh, and your many, many connections with him over the years. Uh, uh, do you feel that his notoriety was uh, uh, w went beyond what uh, what we what you were taught and what you learned with through your father and others that uh, you you don't talk to anybody about uh, what you're doing the mafia the omerta right you know your lips are sealed you don't you don't blast out the God, fact he was the opposite he was out there on the newspapers front right page news. how do you feel about yeah, that do you ahead. think that helped to contribute well, uh, a downfall yeah. of uh, my father and tony Lee's partner they were old timers they didn't care for them i mean i was actually in john's company when he became the boss and i actually saw him sign autographs i mean and when wow. i went to visit my own man my father in prison with tony lee and you know he was uh, you know he was how could he do that i mean they didn't care for it you know, people say he he brought the mob down. I mean, in reality, the Rico stat statue brought, right. the, brought yes. the mob down. Right. They started indicting us for Ricos and putting us away forever. That's he what he did. He brought he brought heat on us. The flash, the pizzazz. He brought heat on us. Um, we paid the price for that. Um, like me, I was a nobody, and every time I got arrested, every time I I had to take a plea or got convicted, I got the most time on the case, and I went to the worst prisons. Because first of all, I was Fat Andy's son, yeah. and I was hooked up with John Gotti. So I, I that's the price I paid for it. Um, did people like getting their pictures in the papers? I mean, they would say no, but I, I believe a lot of guys enjoyed it. I mean, I don't know why it's a sick, it's 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 not healthy, it's not good. But uh, yeah, he brought a lot of heat on us. Um, but he was just that type of guy. He was just a defiant guy. Like he defied the government. And and he believed he wanted none of us to hide. Like he 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 put everybody on front street because he just believed, you know, like fuck them. Mm -hmm. You know. Um uh, yeah. and I love being in his company. I mean, when I went out, it was like being with a celebrity. I mean, you know, we went to clubs, you know, the girls would throw themselves at us because, you know, it was like walking in with you know, with a with an Academy Award winner. So, you know, I was only I was young. I loved it. Well, I loved being in his company. Uh, and he always looked out for me. You know, I say this all the time when I People always ask me, uh, like they, they sort of try to get me to badmouth them or talk bad about them, but I have nothing bad to say. The guy always treated me well. He always treated my family well. I mean, he, for some reason, him and I had this 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 relationship. I think because I went to prison when I was a kid. I was only 23 when I went to jail the first time, and 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 we were both Scorpios. For some reason, he liked that. <laughs> And he always looked out for me. Actually, in 1988, when I went to treatment, I went to treatment because I had a problem with cocaine. And when I got out of treatment, I went to see him. And he actually asked me what I needed. And I needed, I had no car at the time. And, and I said, I don't have a car. And he actually sent me to a car dealership and got me a car. Uh, wow. I mean, that, that's, that was the extent of my relationship with him, how much he looked out for me. Uh, sure. Hey, Anthony, I... I, I I do like to comment from time to time on some of the things you said. First of all, uh, we began the conversation when I told you I was very good friends with Bobby Rydell, whose name was Robert Ritterelli. And I, too, used to like hanging around with him because people wanted to come up and meet him. However, uh, Bobby was not a murderer. He was a rock star. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the other thing is, uh, when, you, when you mentioned about hanging around with him and how women were coming up to him and so on and so forth, would would that have been one of the primary attractions for you folks that in, in the mafia uh, that women uh, and money and mink coats and all that stuff uh, was that what attracted you to it? No, I think that's part of it. What attracted me to it was the power, was the respect, the power that and my respect. Father got like people like my father got. Um, that's what attracted me to it. Uh, you know, like uh, it, it it fed my ego. I could only sure. speak to myself like, you know, I never waited online to get into a club in Manhattan. I mean, I walked into Studio 54. They opened up, you know, uh, the Ritz, you know, the Copacabana, just like the Goodfellas. I, I went into the basement, up through the kitchen, you know. So, I mean, the power, the respect you got is what attracted me. Um, and, of course, the money. I mean, the money, you know, you know, we were making money, you know, how, you know, how, how crazy much? amounts of money. Right. I, I, I'm going to interrupt you, Anthony, because you got a stream of consciousness going here. But 
But like money, like how much money would you be making in a year around that? And I know Studio 54, what year it was, and I'm going to ask you about that, by the way. How much (laughs) money would you be making in a year? Oh, my God. My father would make crazy hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. My father was making, you know, I was, I I worked, like, I I had a, so I worked in a crap game, right? We had crap games. I would get paid, back then, I would get paid three, four hundred dollars a day in 1972. You know, a lot of money. The, the money just kept on rolling in. My father was doing scores. They were hijacking trucks out of Kennedy Airport. I mean, money was just coming in. It was, who knows the number? I mean, Michael Francis was making $8 million a week with a gas, you know, with, with the, uh, in, in, in gas tax money. Correct. So money, people were eight, making crazy money. Anthony, $8 million a week? Yes. That's correct. Yes, and so I, I know that story. You, you mentioned yes. somebody mentioned in in the Get Gaudy series that you folks literally quote owned New York. You, did, you, <laughs> you ran yeah. the construction business. You had the so on and so forth. The, 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 the numbers game, the prostitution, everything was going on. The drugs. Is it true that as portrayed in the Godfather movie, the original Godfather movie, is it true that some of the dons resisted? Dealing in drugs and heroin and all that stuff. Is that, is that a true fact? Yes, very true. Paul Castellano That's was right. one of them. That was his demise. That's right. Listen, a lot of guys were dealing drugs on the down low, especially the guy that crew. They were all major heroin traffickers. You know, uh, Mark Ryder, uh, Sally, uh, Quack Quack. They were all major heroin dealers that were around John. Uh, Arnold Squatteri. I mean, I could name, go on and on and on about uh, Charlie Wingy. I mean, I could name 10 guys that were major heroin traffickers all on the down low. They were making crazy amounts of money. And guys like uh, Carmine Persico and Paul Ca- I mean, Carmine Persico, he was a, a, a captain in Florida named Johnny Iris. They were dealing drugs. He disappeared. Uh, Paul Castellano wanted the tapes. That was his demise because John and them weren't going to give up the tapes because he wanted a, that was would have been John's demise. So Paul got killed. All over heroin, all over tapes, all over guys. That's correct. Carlo Gambino is the one that started that. He 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 put the kibosh to people dealing dealing drugs. Uh, right. I, I but, to, Rob, mm. uh, but I do want to. You mentioned the name that is familiar to me. It's not the same man. You said, did you say Charlie Ingui? I N G U I. No, Charlie Wingy. Charlie Wingy. <laughs> that was his nickname. Well, okay, uh, because um, the song "Express Way to Your Heart" by the Soul Survivors. Is done okay. by a dear friend of mine, Charlie Ingui, uh, his brother and, Richie. Uh, and uh, Charlie actually texted me last night. I want to make clear to the audience that we're not talking, that that man was not on no, the No, it's not him. He was, no. he, he was I a, know that group was one of that group. It's funny you mentioned that group because, you know, Jeremiah, Ali Jeremiah's brother was in that group. Well, because he comes from Ozone Park, one well, of the really, I, I, it's we're all connected here, buddy. Because when, when <laughs> I when I met Charlie and his brother, we went to dinner, and I said we're going to order uh, Francis Ford Coppola wine. And what do you guys do when you're not singing? I, uh, breaking up legs or something. But anyway, Charlie's a dear friend. Um, uh, I could go on forever. Uh, one thing is, when uh, how often would you go to Studio Fifty Four? Well, I went to Studio. I, so when I came out of prison in 1980, there was two major clubs in Manhattan. It was Studio 54 was uptown, right. and there was this rock club called The Ritz. The Ritz. Was downtown. Right. Now today it's Webster Hall. So I was more in The Ritz than Studio 54, but I was in Studio... I would go to Studio 54 at least twice a month. I would say maybe three times a month. You know, I knew Steve Rebell. You know, he was a friend of mine. Later on, yeah. him and I had a little disagreement there. After he got out of prison... We had a little disagreement, him and I, and we stopped talking to each other. But before he went to prison, we were friends, uh, and I would go there. But I basically hung out in the Ritz because um, Stanley London, he was the owner. Um, he was very good friends with us. He was around this guy called Matty the Horse, who was a big guy with the Genovese's. Um, and we had a really good relationship. And, and so the celebrities back then... There were certain nights of the week they would go to certain clubs. And on Thursday night was the night they all went to the Ritz because upstairs was all VIP, roped off tables. And my brother and I always had a table upstairs. And who were... Who, yeah, right, what people? Yeah. yeah, who were some of the people that uh, would yeah. show up? Were they... Uh, oh, and the Ritz? Yeah. On any given... Andy Warhol, Keith Richards, Diana Summers sat at my table one night. Um... 
Diana Ross, Tina Turner. Um, every, I mean, you named them. They were there. David Bowie. I, I mean, I drank it. I met David Bowie would come there. Uh, Mick Jagger was in there. Whoever used to go to the 50, Studio 54 would come to the Ritz on certain, one, certain nights. I'm in there one night. I was in there one night at my table, and the owner came over and he said, listen, I just got a call from Diana Ross. I have no tables empty. Could she sit at your table? And I said, of, of course. And Diana Ross came with Gene Simmons and sat at my table. Kiss. Which at the time, she was dating Gene, because Gene Simmons back then dated her and then Cher or maybe Cher and then her, I don't know, but he was dating both of them. And they both, and Gene Simmons sat right next to me. And I'll never forget, he ordered a club soda and she ordered a beer. No kidding. That, uh, <laughs> uh, d- 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 uh, was there any of those people that uh, that you didn't like uh, any of those stars that were arrogant or whatever? Or did you like? Were they all friendly well, to you? I, I had I had a little argument one night in there with Frank Zappa. With Zappa? It, yeah, Frank Zappa. Yeah, yeah. He so he was in there, and and the owner came up to me, and and intro- we were in the back in the v- the sort of VIP at another private room, and I was in the room, and he was in there, and um, I went in there, and Stanley introduced me to him. And he invited me over to his table. So I went over to his table and he just did something that I don't know. I, I he turned and I and I said something nasty to him and we had some words and he went to Stanley London, the owner, and told him I cursed at him and it was just a little thing. Me so me and Frank Zappa didn't see eye to eye. Well, and Zappa's also an Italian too. So, uh, but 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 a tough guy. Yeah, just a little, Zappa. just a little. Yeah. It just well, while, while you're talking about some of these people and the clubs and uh, the the connection between some of the uh, celebrities, movie stars, uh, rock and roll icons that you've mentioned, and organized crime. Did you see the connection? Like growing up. Uh, you know, I know your dad and you were friends with Frankie Valli, with uh, with all of the, uh, you know, the old time rock rockers. That's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. What kind what of connection uh, uh, did you see between some of these guys and organized crime? I think the celebrities like hanging out with organized crime members. Yeah. I mean, we they Sweden. It was like we didn't seek them out. They, they, they sought after us. We didn't like, I didn't walk into the Ritz or walk into Jilly's with my father and Frank Sinatra would be sitting at a table and I would go, oh my God, there's Frank Sinatra. Let's go <laughs> sit with him. You know, we would go to the bar and then Frank Sinatra would send somebody over and say, would you like to come sit, you know, have a drink? And then he would invite us over, you know, like they wanted to sit, he wanted to sit with us. Like I'll give you a, for instance, Frank Sinatra. Okay, Frank yes. Sinatra used to hang out in Jilly's when he was in New York. Sure. My father was very good friends with Jilly and his partner, Tony Lee. They would go in there and Sinatra would be there. And Sinatra would, would invite my father over to the table and my father would respectfully decline, say, no, that's okay. And he wouldn't go. He would one decline? Asked, okay. One night I asked my father, why don't you want to sit with this guy? And this was what, this was what my, my father's answer. He goes, because listen, He's a bad drinker. And I heard that he gets drunk sometimes and he abuses wise guys and they don't do nothing. He goes, if he abuses me, I'm going to knock him off the chair and then I'm going to have an issue. So he wouldn't sit with him. A little later on, he was in Jilly's. They went to the Copa one night. And after the Copa, they went to Jilly's and my mother was with him. My mother, my brother and his girlfriend, my cousin Joey and his girlfriend. And they went to Jilly's and Sinatra was there. And he invited my father over to the table. And my mother wanted to go sit there because she was Frank Sinatra. Sure. So yes. my father, to appease my mother, he went and sat at, with Sinatra and hung out with Sinatra. And they became friends. And later on, he actually put Jay Black, the last movie that Jane Sinatra America. made. Go ahead. Contract on, right, Jay and America. The last movie Sinatra made, contract, contract on Cherry Street, Jay was in the movie, and Jay killed Sinatra at the end. That's how the movie ended. Really? That's Sinatra's last role. Wow. What, what, what was uh, uh, Anthony, by the way, that story was fantastic. Yes. What was the name of the movie? Contract on Cherry Street. 
Okay, because uh, I've I have are you met, familiar with it, Derry? I, I I yes, and I've met the, I've met the uh, the new J in the Americans. Uh, uh, there's been three J's. You're talking about the original J, J Black, J, J Black, J Black, who passed away. I'm talking away. about the best one. No, yeah, well, the best, of yeah, course. Yes, of course. The uh, voice. All the hits. Used to call him the voice. All, right. The voice. Uh, uh, Anthony, all the hits from Jay and the Americans came from Jay Black, a uh, wonderful man. Uh, that was a fascinating story. Uh, so I think Rob, what Rob was getting to was, do, do you think there was any official connection? For example, yep. Rydell was not, uh, did not have any connections to, to, the, to that business. I but he was friends he, with him. Right. Yes. He was I, friends with him. There you go. But, but but in terms of, was there any official? Right. Uh, yes. To answer your question, yes, there was actually people. Sinatra was on record with Chicago. He was directly with the Chicago yes. crew. Jay Black was on record with Fat Andy. Um, Frankie Valley was on record with Wise Guys from New Jersey. So there was always an affiliation between the mob and, and the entertainment industry because, first of all, they ran the unions. The, you got People have to understand the mob had it. The, first of all, the mob owned all the nightclubs. So back in the 50s and 40s and 50s and 60s, where were these people going to make money? Where were they going right. to entertain? They owned Vegas. The mob owned Vegas. They owned the Copa. They owned the, uh, 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 every nightclub. Name a nightclub. The mob owned it. So right. these people had to do business with the mob. You walked in my house. Louis Prima used to come over my house for, for Sunday dinner. Wow. Frankie Valley used to come over my house. Frankie Valley would call my father up and ask my father to make pasta vazufa. I mean, you know, pasta, <laughs> just like pasta. Do you still have uh, Anthony? Do you still have some of those recipes? Yeah. yeah. If you, if you no, do, my, you know, it's funny that you asked that because my father, he he, we used to ask him like how he made things and what he put in it, and he used to go like this with his finger. He used to say he started with his finger. So, uh, but I know, yeah, I know some tricks he used, but I don't okay. have anything written down. But I, I, I basically know how he made certain dishes. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, I met Frankie Valley just very briefly when he yeah. came to Maine. Uh, uh, by the way, he appeared uh, for the malt shop cruise in Puerto Rico. I think the the fee was a hundred grand. But in any event, did, uh, did you like Frankie Valley? Did you like him? Oh, I loved Frankie Valley. Yeah, uh, no, he treated me really well. He loved my mother. He would, uh, he would, you know, he would come to the front of the stage and 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 tell my mother, "This one's for you, Jenny," and oh. sing to my mother. Wow. You know, he, uh, no, he was a great guy. Uh, he, my father really cared about him. Uh, he would come to my house and have dinner, and I would meet him, and you know, take he would take me with him to shows. Um, no, I had a great time with them. Uh, and I was young. It was. It was. He was a really good guy, and 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 he really, really was close to my parents. He really liked my parents. He was a good guy. Go ahead, he was Go ahead Anthony. Guy. Yeah, I, I just Anthony. And you understand that Bobby Rydell, uh, who was f uh, featured uh, in the movie The Green Book, uh, they opened with Bobby Rydell yeah. at the Copa. At the Copa, and yeah. Bobby indeed right. was the youngest performer ever to uh, be at the Copa. Did you ever see Bobby at the at the Copa? No, I never saw Bobby. I saw Bobby Darren at the Copa. You saw Bobby Darren? Did you get to meet Bobby Three times. Darren? I'll tell you. I could tell you a little story about Bobby yeah, Darren. Yeah, please. Please do. Please, please do. So my sister is graduating from eighth grade. Bobby Darren was appearing at the Copa that weekend. So we all go. I have pictures of that. Of the, I, I have pictures from that night at the Copa. Yeah. So we go to the Copa. And we see the show. He's phenomenal. Bobby Diamond oh, yeah. was in person. Phenomenal. Played every instrument. I mean, he was dynamite in person, Bobby Diamond. Great entertainer. So a lot of times after the show, when I went to the Copa, we would go upstairs to the lounge. And Carmine, he was the head guy. He ran the Copa for Julius Spadell. He would bring over the entertainers to meet us. Like Don Wrinkles. They brought Don Wrinkles over one night to meet my father, and he was pinching my cheek, Don Wrinkles. <laughs> so my father wanted Bobby Darren to meet my sister. So after the show, we went upstairs to the lounge, and Bobby Darren never showed up. So Carmine came over, and he was like kind of nervous, and he says to my father, he goes, Andy, listen, this guy left. He goes, he left. Did he know we were waiting? And he says, yeah, but he left. So we, we left the Copa. The next night, my old man comes home. He tells my sister. Now, my sister's a kid to get dressed. 
And I say, where are you going? He goes, I'm taking your sister to the Copa. I said, oh, am I coming? He goes, no, just her and I are going. He took my sister back to the Copa. That night, my sister came home with albums, pictures, autographs. I mean, that <laughs> will show up the next night. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Anthony, I got to tell you something. Yeah. I, I knew we were going to talk about the mob, but I love talking <laughs> about these celebrities. I mean, that, that story... Uh, and I, I got to tell you what I enjoy most about you and Gianni Russo and Elite is that I tell people their stories are real and they're credible. Right. And, yeah. and yeah. the way you tell them, you don't embellish them. No. Because you could have said, I went to the, I saw Bobby Darren, he put, and you talk about Don Rickles, one of the greatest comedians of all time. Yeah. I'm just enjoying this show so yes. much. Oh, oh, you gotta, he, he was great when he came. So after we saw Jay Black. So what happened was Jay wanted to go. My father didn't want to go see Don Rinkles because of, of how he abuses everybody That's in the right. audience. That's right. So Jay Black and his wife, Kathy, they wanted to see him. And I wanted to see him with my wife, Alice. So my father gave in and said, OK, we'll go. So we go. So we sat in the Copa. We didn't sit in the front. We sat in the back along the rail. So he couldn't really get to us with his abuse. You know, like you were <laughs> so he put on it. He was hysterical. He was great. Then we go upstairs to the lounge, and Carmine brings him over, and he had a fur coat on. Don Rickles, and he walks over, and my father says to him, "What do you want to drink?" And he goes, "Whatever you want, anything you, want <laughs> you know, whatever you're having." You know, and it was just, it was just a that's great, awesome. A great night, you know. Yeah. And and then he introduced himself to Jay. I mean, he liked Jay's music, you know. And then it was just, he was pinching my cheek and he was scoofing on his front coat, you know, and all that That's, stuff. It was, it was just, a, you know, and, and that, you know, getting back to the mark. So you see that, that's how I got caught up in that life too. Of you know, course. you got to understand now I'm a kid, I'm only in my early twenties and I'm, you know, this is my life. And, you know, you think it's never going to end and you don't see the dark side of it. I didn't see the dark side of it yet, you know, but later on, you know, going to prison, you know, having an issue with drugs, right. you know, uh, you know, then, then the doctor said in, you know, uh, it, it, and we'll talk. People, we want to talk about yeah. that, too. I wanted to ask you some questions uh, involving your connection with uh, with Gotti and the Gambino crime family and your dad, uh, Sammy, the bull Gravano. Yes. What do you what's your what's your impression of Sammy? Do you consider him a rat? I know we've had John Elite on our show and John, you know, obviously worked with uh, with uh, Gravano. Uh, doesn't have a lot of respect for him. Had John has tremendous respect for Gotti as a stand-up guy, wouldn't rat. But uh, he said uh, he he doesn't have a lot of regard for uh, Gravano because he ratted out Listen, his boss. John cooperated. I love John A. Like he's a very good friend of mine. My brother was absolutely. My brother was his little league coach. Oh, uh, really? So. That's yeah, right. He yeah, mentioned he, that. He mentioned that. Yeah. Uh, he, was my coach? brother was a little league coach. Oh, wow. Listen, okay. I cooperated. Uh, Sammy cooperated. I, all I could say is I have a great relationship with Sammy. I always did before when I was in the street, when he was the underboss. And right now, you know, I just went out to Arizona a couple of months back. I did his show. I got, uh, you know, it really worked out well for me. Um, as a matter of fact, I just spoke to him yesterday on the phone. So my relationship with Sammy is, is different than John. John okay. had other issues with Sammy that I didn't have over money or whatever. I don't have those issues. Sammy and I have a good relationship. He cooperated. I cooperated. You know, um, so we're both in the same boat, actually. But I have a good relationship with Sammy. Um, we get along well. Unfortunately, John doesn't, which I wish he did, but he doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I have some, I'm, I'm working on other things to do with Sammy. So my relationship with Sammy is good. Excellent. Uh, uh, Excellent. Uh, uh, thank you, Rob, for that one. I, I, and you mentioned John, who, by the way, some of the people that watch our show have said to us, it sounds like you're glorifying the mob and so on and so forth. And my response is no. The casino movie did. Uh, the Godfather trilogy did. Uh, you were part of the American culture. That's what. That's the way it was. Exactly. Uh, but uh, and you mentioned John, who I uh, he came to Maine. By the way, uh, I'm not going to say this to you, but when John finished his interview here, I took off my microphone and said, "John, I don't think you're so tough." 
and, <laughs> and, and he, he laughed, and then he asked Rob and I to do a tribute, uh, at least a video tribute for his birthday. Uh, but uh, do you know Gianni Russo? Do you know Gianni, who's been on our show? I don't know him personally, no. Yeah, but, but he, but, he but, knows who he but is. you know of him. I know who, of course, yeah, I know who he is. Uh, and and I, I just want to ask you some, some, some questions that Gianni has brought up. Number one. Uh, you were you were around in 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 the sixties. You were there. Uh, do you agree with Gianni that the uh, that the mob was involved in the murder of JFK? Yes, I do. Uh, and do you also believe, uh, uh, as he clearly pointed out, that Jack Ruby was absolutely uh, uh, ordered? Uh, to go and kill Lee Harvey Oswald. I think Jack Ruby was definitely part of a mob conspiracy to kill Oswald, without a doubt. The guy had terminal cancer when he shot Oswald. He um, did. Okay. See, that, those are the kind of answers, because I watched the, uh, the show again about uh, Oswald getting shot the other yep. night. Uh, and uh, it's amazing. So I'm going to ask you a question that I wanted to ask Gianni. How did the Warren Commission come up with Oswald's the only guy. Why, why did they come up with that? Was it a whitewash? Yeah, whitewash. I think it was a whitewash. I think it was just a major conspiracy. I think not only the mob had their hand there. Don't forget, you got to understand, the CIA and the CIA. mob. CIA. Yeah. The CIA and the mob, they wanted the mob to kill Castro. I mean, the, with, 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 with loaded cigars. I mean, yeah. the CIA worked hand in hand. Even going back to World War II, they came to the, the U.S. government came to the, mo the mafia in New York to protect the docks. He's, I mean, he's, Lucky he's Luciano right. got out of prison. I mean, we could go back to the 40s and 50s. Lucky Luciano got deported because they agreed to help the government protect the docks. And the pay and and the payoff was that they would let Lucky Luciano out of prison, but he had to get deported, which was fine with him because he was a multi-gazillionaire. He would live like a king in Italy and, and yeah. Cuba was 90 miles away from the United States. So... It was a win-win. So, the, so the relationship with the mafia and the government goes back so many years. Later on, of course, the government went after us with the RICO and all that other stuff. But, but back in the day, no. And I always heard my own man used to tell me all the time that the reason why Kennedy got killed was, first of all, because of his father. Joe Kennedy was a criminal. He was an out-and-out -out bootlegger. He was partners with the mafia. He was partners with with Frank Costello. He was. And when, when Kennedy was running for president, they went to the Teamsters to get the Teamsters to back Kennedy, and they did. Kennedy became president. He made his brother attorney general, and they double-crossed everybody, and, which they did. Which is and, what and, uh, Gianni had told us. I, when, I've got when, to say to you, uh, Anthony, I've said that to people. I said, that little did they know, uh, one of the biggest jock fakes, was that the Jack, JFK gets elected, and who does he put for attorney general but his younger brother? And and what's the first thing he do? I'm going after uh, Hoffer and yeah, the mob. And, he's and, going after and, the and, people and, that his father made you right, know, right. them in office. Exactly. So, so we're all in agreement with that, and yet it's, yeah. Rob, do you find it sometimes hard to convince people of that? And you, so if you, if you watch that yeah. JFK so, movie... Some people don't want to hear it. They don't want to go that listen. road. Anthony, go I, ahead. Yeah. My old man told me when I was a teenager, the real mafia was the government. He goes, when he goes, that's the real mafia. He goes, he told me a story once. He, it's, he told me, he goes, let me tell you about the founding fathers. He goes, one day in Philadelphia, John Adams and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and all these guys were in a pub in Philadelphia drinking beer. And one of them said to the other one, hey, why are we sending this English bastard all this money and we can keep it for ourselves? And they started a fucking revolution. He said, and then after that, they wrote the book on treachery. He said, and think about it. I mean, <laughs> he, may, he may have had a point. Yeah. Anthony, no, I you're, you're, you you're right. You're right. Anthony, I got to tell you something, buddy. We've had a lot of people on our shows, but you're the first one to malign the founding fathers, <laughs> John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, yeah. the fathers of our country on Mount Rushmore, and you're going after them. This is the last time you're appearing on this show. Yeah. No, Anthony. Going after them. Just stay, listen, that was his theory that, you know, they wanted to keep the money for themselves, so they started a revolution. That's, that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's funny as hell. Listen, uh, 
We talked about it. Uh, we mentioned movies, The Godfather, yeah. Goodfellas. Right. Actually, in Goodfellas, your dad is is mentioned in Goodfellas, yeah. isn't he? Yes. Uh, one of one of the classic movies of all time. But uh, do you have any favorites? Do you? Yeah. I mean, it, uh, well, of course, I, I think Goodfellas was the best one. I mean, it's funny because when it first came out in the movie theater, you know, I went to see it with all my friends and our girlfriends, and I'm in the movie theater. And I, I knew Henry and all of them were good friends with, with us. I mean, I knew Paulie Valio since I was a little kid. I used to go to his house with Tony Lee and my father. Yeah. So I and we, so I knew all of them all my life. And Jimmy Burke, I dated his daughter Kathy. I just wow. went in and out of his house. I mean, I knew all of them. Hold so on, hold on, hold on. Derry, Derry's right. just uh... listen. You dated his da his daughter Kathy. Yeah, we were best friends. I dated his daughter when we were kids. Yeah. Yeah, Kathy Burke. Yeah, she was a very, very dear friend of mine. And his two sons, I knew Frankie uh, that got married, and unfortunately, and Jesse, I knew. He named his two sons after Frank and Jesse James. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, his son's name was Frankie and Jesse after the James brothers. Jesse. Yeah. But uh, the, the, yeah, the. Yeah, that's the truth. So the yeah. Bro uh, Bronx Tale, Chaz Palamentari, yeah. and De Niro. Yeah, that was uh, a good one. I, but my personal. What's one, your favorite? Fellows, yep. Casino. Yeah, um, Donnie Brasco, I liked. I think that was Brasco really was real. good, wasn't it? Yeah, yes. very good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Bronx Tale was was on the money. I mean, you know, those those are my probably my favorites. The Sopranos, I mean, is that was that was pretty much on the money. Um, I, I, outside of him going to see a psychologist, that would have never happened. <laughs> in their life. They would have murdered him, right? You know, okay. that, that, that that's not going to happen. That a boss is going to go to see a psychiatrist. Yeah, um, Anthony, uh, I got to tell you, in my living room is a giant poster signed by The Sopranos. I bought it in New Orleans. I, it's hanging in my living room because that was indeed over the it's top It's just a classic. And what yeah. you're telling me, and I, was, I can't believe how you read my mind in this interview, that when I left the house, I go, I gotta ask him how accurate was The Sopranos. And what you're telling me is that it was accurate except for the fact that there's no way that uh, James right. Gandolfini, Tony, would have gone to a psychiatrist. Yeah, no. Listen, the mob, listen, I, I, and I know the dark side of the mob. I knew my, my, we had a very dear friend of mine. Um, he was a soldier. He was a wise guy in the Colombo family. Um, he was good friends with my father and Tony Lee. I was good friends with his sons. And he, back then in the seventies, he had a nervous breakdown. Now, nobody knew like today is a name, this bipolar, there's all kinds of medication. <laughs> nobody knew. Back then, he had a, a nervous breakdown, and he went to a psych ward. Um, he and he, he got medicated, whatever. He got out of the psych ward, <clears throat> and about a year later, he had another nervous breakdown, legit. You know, he, and uh, and um, he went back into the psych ward, and when he got out, he disappeared. Wow! Oh my goodness. You know, that's how the mob dealt with. You know, that's how that's how you know the mob dealt with those kind of issues. So, so, you know, when you talk about the Sopranos, that, that would have never happened. You know, maybe today it might. <clears throat> of course, the mafia is a different, it's a different scenario today. But back in the day, in the 60s and 70s, that would have never happened. Uh, uh, I, I, Anthony, I, I, I want to ask you one question uh, that will sound like it's, well, anyway, I'm, I'm going I'm to ask it. The concern that I've got about, about your activities, their activities, is that, yeah, they were killing each other and whatever and, and whatever, but do you have any estimate about the number of innocent people that might have gotten caught in the crosswire, the waitress that's in the room, the, uh, the, the people that are walking down the street when the bullets are flying? Do you have any estimate as to how many innocent people, just a ballpark estimate, people that had no ax to grind that were either injured- What, in or, New York? Or, in or, New yeah, York or, or people- anywhere, uh, New York, uh, that were killed or injured because of the activities of the mafia? Uh, probably hundreds. I mean, I, I don't have a, a number, but I, I know for a fact innocent people that got killed with, with, you know, when hits took place. I mean, I know this guy, uh, a friend of ours, Tony Plate, he was in the 70s. He disappeared. He showed up. Uh, he showed up at a restaurant with an innocent bystander that drove him there, and they both disappeared. So unfortunately, that 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 happened. But that happens, and it happened probably numerous times. People disappearing, people getting killed, people being in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
I mean, it happened probably a lot of, too many times. But well, to say a, a specific number, I, I don't know. But yeah. I know for sure it has happened many, many times. Well, that, that's, that was my, because when we, when we see the movies, uh, you know, we see the, 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 the bad guys shooting each other. But I want to uh, thank you for your honesty, because what you said was a lot. And, and, and oh, even one oh, is too many. Right. Uh, and the one thing I'm going to ask you, I, I know I'm chiming in more, but you, go ahead. Do you have any solution to the massacres that are taking place in this country on a daily basis? Just happened here in Lewiston, Maine, the biggest one so far, 18 people killed by a, a, a gunman. Uh, do, you ha do you yourself have any suggestions as to how we stop this massacre? You know, it's mental. I mean, yeah, we have to, you know, it has to be dealt with mental health issues, gun, some kind of gun control. I mean, they're never going to get rid of the guns in this country. Let's be realistic. I mean, the guns are never going to. But let's modify it. Let's do. Do, do I think people need automatic weapons? No, I don't think they do. That's just my opinion. Yep. But I think it, I think they have to start with cleaning up. You know, like there's, 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 a, there's a mental health issue in this country that's not being addressed. I mean, normal people don't get a gun and go kill 18 people. Something's, right. or where's the parents? Where, where's the home? Where's the family structure? I mean, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, you never heard of this happening. Never. Not I mean, like it, I, not I like know, today. Even, That's even correct. Suicide. Yeah. Today, kids 14 years old are committing suicide. When I was 14, I didn't even know what suicide was. Yeah. That's, uh, that's true. Great answer, Anthony. Yes. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. Uh, you have, uh, spent your life uh, being closely associated with the mafia. Uh, you've been, you've served time in jail. Uh, now your life today, talk about your life today, you, uh, reform, you, your, your organization, Reform Gangsters. Uh, what is that about? What are you trying to do with your life going forward here, Anthony? I'm trying to tell people that, listen, I live, I live, in the beginning, it was glamorous. It was fun. You know, the, it was it was action, um, and then it wasn't. You know, and 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 what came along with that was drug addiction, failed marriages, prison time. Um, you know, and I tell people, listen, guys like John Gotti and my father, Fat Andy, their lives aren't success stories. Even get Gotti, as much of a smash shit as it was, and which it was. You know, I wrote a thing on my Instagram and my Facebook that you know, listen. It was a great show, but it was about a tragedy because right. that man died handcuffed to a bed. And along the way, people lost their lives. Right. So it was it really it wasn't a love story. It was a tragedy, you know. Um, yep. And my message is that it's never too late to change. Listen, I, I changed my life in my 50s. It's never too late to change. Don't get lost by the glitter. You know, all that glitters isn't gold. And, and my message is. That if I could change, you could change. I mean, I'm coming up in January. I'll be clean from drugs and alcohol for 35 years. Congratulations. I went back, 35 I went back years. to school to become a counselor at 60 years old. You know, wow. I had, listen, when I, when I decided to get out of the mafia, I had no skills. My father didn't teach me how to use a tool. I had, I couldn't use a hammer. I don't, I don't know how to build anything. I don't know how to fix anything. I have, I, I don't know none of that. Do I know how to be a bookmaker and a Shylock and an extortionist and, 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 and a violent criminal? I know how to do that really well, but I don't know how to you, change a flat. I mean, you know, <laughs> Neither um, do I. So, so I, had no, I had no skills. I had, I had, you know, I had my, I had no skills. So at six, so my life experience was my education that helped me become a counselor. And now today, because of all that, shit I went through, now I could use that for something positive. And that's my message, that it's never too late to change. And like that life may look pretty and it might look glamorous when you watch TV. Yeah. But, you know, when you're, when you're in a visiting room and your little daughter and your son are crying because the visit ended and they're going, Daddy, when are you coming home? You know, I'm getting emotional right now. Yeah. So that, that, you know. Is is it worth it then? No, no. Do uh, you have uh, Anthony? Uh, do you have any children? How many children do you have? If I have two children, I have a forty year old son now and a thirty year old daughter. And and I admit, listen, the last my son, the first twenty one years of his life, he was he grew up in visiting rooms. My father, 
wow. and myself were in prison the, his, the first 21 years of his life. My daughter, I went to prison when she was three, and I got out when she was 11. My son was 13 the last time I went to prison. I got out. He was 21. They raided my house in 1995. The, um, the Organized Crime Task Force raided my house with a search warrant. I was handcuffed on my couch, and my daughter was in her diapers running around my house asking me, now they're ripping my house apart, searching my house, and my daughter's telling me, Daddy, are these your friends? Wow. Uh, this, uh, you know, it, like, it's, wow. Uh, what's, it, you know, and that that's, and that's what I want people to understand. This is the, and this is the result of that life. Uh, Anthony, uh, I've Thank gotta, you. I've got to say to you, I was looking forward to this interview. But I did not realize I would enjoy it as much as I have. Your, Amen. Your uh, getting emotional at the end uh, means you are uh, you are reformed. You served yes. your time, and I say this to the camera: He served his time. Yes. Uh, as a lawyer, when you represent a client and they go to jail, they've served their time. I want to make one comment as we close here, my dear friend. And that is the picture behind you of your father and your mother, which yes. you said uh, John Gotti had commissioned. I do want to tell you, it is the only portrait I have ever seen in my life from the Louvre to the National Gallery of Art <laughs> where your father is holding a cigarette. I see left. that. I see yes. that. <laughs> my yeah. father always had a cigarette. I uh, always had a cigarette. In his what hand. a great. In the picture, so yeah. that was a little black and white picture. So what happened was I was in John Gotti's house over 40 years ago, and I was in his house, and he had all these portraits on his wall. And I go, wow, John, those are really nice portraits. He goes, yeah. He goes, when I was in the joint, I met a counterfeiter that became a portrait artist. And, and, and for making money, he went to make them portraits. And he said he did them all photographs. So in my wallet, I had a little black and white picture of them, of my father and mother standing in my grandmother's backyard, dressed like that. And my father had a cigarette in his hand, and I gave John the picture, and he goes, oh, let me see what he could do. And about a month later, uh, he sent for me, and he gave me that portrait. Fantastic. Well, all what I, a great all story. I can tell you, Anthony, is that's the only good deed he ever did in his life. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Anthony. Folks, thank you. Uh, we're out of time uh, uh, on the Runlet and Baldacci Report with our good friend, Anthony. Thank Anthony, you. thank you very much. The thank hour you. went Don't by so fast. ReformGangsters.com. ReformGangsters.com. Excellent. Have a pleasure. Have a nice day. Try to stay warm up there, okay? We okay. will. I'm thank good. you. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, fellas.